Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous video, we reviewed Power Series. Now it's time to put that into action. And in particular, what we're going to do today is focus on how we can solve differential equations using Power Series. The main crux of what we're going to do is we are going to expand out the solution to the differential equation as a power series, and then try and find those coefficients, remember we called them a n, that correspond to a solution to the differential equation. Now I'm going to show you how we do this with an example that you know the answer to already, uh, but before we get there, let's set the stage. Now throughout this lecture and many that follow it, we are going to study second order differential equations of this form. So they're going to be homogeneous for now. Now second order, we're going to switch the independent variable to x. I know that we've been using t a lot. Typically we're, we're going to use x in this case just because power series are typically written as expansions in x and so it just feels a little more natural. But if you don't like it, go ahead, put everything in terms of t. You know, it's just nice to familiar to familiarize yourself with different notation systems and make sure you can switch between them very, very easily. Now, you can also do this for higher order equations. We're not going to focus on that for now. We can just work on second order equations, but just like we've seen with everything else in this class so far, all of the theory that we developed for second order equations, it works for higher order equations too. It just makes things a little messier. Okay. So let's start this off. We are going to assume for the time being that P, Q, and R are polynomials. Polynomials. And what I really mean by this is that they have a power series expansion. In this case, polynomials are a power series themselves. It's just a finite power series, right? So the coefficients a n are equal to zero for large enough values of n. Essentially, that's what I'm assuming here. We're going to make this more precise in the coming lectures. But for now, here's the idea. So we can set a goal for ourselves. We want to solve the differential equation. And we're going to pick a point to center it around. So we're going to solve it uh, around or near x equal to x naught. Now, you should have some intuition of why I'm saying around here. Because if you think about how a power series works, we have to expand it and we have to center it around a certain value. So, first of all, we have two different cases here. The first one is if p of x naught does not equal to zero, then x zero is an ordinary point. Okay, an ordinary point. Now, ordinary points are important for us because ordinary points are typically where we get existence and uniqueness of solutions, right? Remember how we do this? We divide off the p and get q over p and r over p. And as long as those things are continuous, so as long as you're not dividing by zero, then you've got existence and uniqueness of a solution. So we're going to characterize places where we get existence and uniqueness by so-called ordinary points in x. Well then, of course, there's a second case here. And this is when you have a root of p. And we don't call these things extraordinary. We call them a singular point. Now again, you probably understand why that's a singular point, right? Because if we try to divide by zero, that's a singularity in an equation. So the notation here uh, sort of should make sense. Now, we are going to start by focusing right here. We are going to start with ordinary points. We'll work our way up to getting to singular points. We will get there, but for the time being, let's work with ordinary points. And so what that means is we are going to write the solution to this differential equation, y of x. Again, solution is guaranteed to exist from our existence uniqueness theory. We're going to write this as a power series. So a0 plus a1 x minus x naught plus 
a2, x minus x naught squared, so on and so forth, which of course we have a shorthand notation for this, which is just our usual power series notation. So this is the basic premise. That's all we're trying to do. We're going to assume that y has that form, and then I'm going to put it into the differential equation. I'm going to do my best to solve. Okay? That is the general principle. Let me walk you through an example to talk about this. Okay, so let's look at something we probably are quite good at. Nice little second order differential equation. This thing has characteristic equation r squared plus 1 is equal to 0, so that has roots plus or minus i. We probably didn't need to use the characteristic equation to know that the solutions to this thing are sine and cosine. Well, the nice thing is sine and cosine have very well-known power series. So if we are going to have a power series expansion to this solution or to this differential equation, they should, in theory at least, look like the power series that we get for sine and cosine because we know that's the solution. <clears throat> okay, let's try it out. Here's the idea. Let's write y is equal to the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity of a n. And in this case, let's center it around x equal to 0. The reason I wanted to use x equal to 0 is because this is where we typically center sine and cosine around. So if we want to be able to confirm that we're getting what we think we should be getting, then let's center ourselves around 0. Okay, so maybe we can maybe make a note of that, but this gives us x0 is equal to 0. Okay, so first thing I'm going to need is some derivatives, right? If I'm going to assume y is a solution to this thing, I need to know what y double prime is. Let's start with y prime, one derivative at a time here. All right, now I get n a n x to the n minus 1. So, typically, the first term here is going to be 0. This is the same as starting counting at n equal to 1. Right? And that makes sense to you, probably, because this, co this constant term differentiates down to 0. So you're now starting at n equal to 1. Okay? So all I did we started the count appropriately. Same thing, let's keep going. y double prime, n equal to, let's say, 1. I'm taking this thing and I'm going to differentiate it term-wise. n times n minus 1, a n, x to the n minus 2. Same thing that happened with the first derivative. I lost on two derivatives the constant and the linear term. I'm starting counting at n equal to 2, so we might as well make the sum reflect this to eliminate redundancies. Uh, n times n minus 1, a n x to the n minus 2. Now I've got all the ingredients. I've got y double prime. I've got y prime. I've got everything I need here. So let's go ahead and put it into the differential equation. Well, when I put it into the ODE, so let's say put into ODE. Well, I get y double prime. So let's say 0 is equal to y double prime plus y. That's my ordinary differential equation. When this thing goes in, n equal to 2 to infinity, n times n minus 1 a n uh, x n minus 2. So that's my second derivative term plus sum from n equal to 0 to infinity of n times a n. Uh, sorry, there's no n anymore. This is just a, uh, the original function x to the n. Pardon me. So now what I would like to do is give everybody the same generic term in here, right? I want everything in terms of xn's. So that means that I'm going to have to do a rearrangement here. 
So what I would like to do is add two to every single n here so I can get this up to an n, x to the n term. So if I'm gonna add two, I get n plus two times n plus one, an plus two, xn. And since I went up by two, I gotta start counting two less. So I get n to infinity. And then I get plus the sum from n equal to zero to infinity of a n x to the n. But now, starting counting from the same place, same generic term, if these things are equal to zero, that actually tells me that this thing plus that thing is equal to zero for every single n. So what that gives me is n plus two times n plus one, a n plus two is, uh, sorry, plus a n is equal to zero for all n greater than or equal to zero. So this is just using one of those properties that we reviewed in the previous lecture, right? We have we can add these things together component wise and because it's equal to zero, that tells you every term in the series also has to be equal to zero. So let's rearrange this. This gives me a n plus two is equal to minus a n divided by n plus two times n plus one. Now what we would like to do to solve this thing is we would like to identify a general pattern for this recurrence relation, right? This is a second order difference equation. It's linear. Let's try and solve it. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put in values of n and we're going to ask ourselves what comes out of this. So n equal to zero. Okay, at n equal to zero, I get a two is equal to minus a zero divided by two times one. Now, I'm typically when you're looking for patterns when you're doing these things, I like to write the multiplication as two times one because a lot of times factorials pop out. So I'm gonna leave it as two times one even if you think that that's a silly idea. Then n is equal to one. Well, here I get a three is equal to minus a one divided by three times two. Okay, let's keep going. n equal to two, this gives me a four is equal to, so minus a two over four times three, but I know what a two is, so I might as well put it in. I get a zero divided by four times three times two times one. So I've got a four factorial. This is why I didn't multiply it out, right? Because I don't want to write uh, 24 there it's hard for me to recognize that that's four factorial. Let's do n equal to three. A five, well, in this case, is equal to minus a three divided by five times four, which is the same as a one divided by five times four times three times two. So there's a five factorial coming through. Let's do one more round before we settle in on what's happening here. A6, well in this case, this is, I'm going to skip right to the A0 term, minus A0 divided by six factorial. Similarly, uh, N equal to five gives me A7, which is equal to minus A0 divided by seven factorial. And you can keep going but what I really want to emphasize is why I wrote this in the table form that I wrote it in. Look at everybody that is an even multiple of n depends on a zero. Everybody that is an odd multiple of a n depends on a one. Sorry, I made a mistake here. So what do I get? Well, for even multiples of n, so so I'm writing 2n to represent every even number. I get minus one to the n, a zero, divided by 2n factorial. So go ahead and check, right? n equal to one, that gives me minus one, a zero, two factorial. Same thing for n equal to two, so on and so forth. 
and every odd number similarly is going to give me minus 1 to the n. It alternates between positive and negative. A 1 divided by 2n plus 1 factorial. And so let's put this all into our differential or into our solution. So therefore, y is equal to the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n uh, a0 divided by 2n factorial x to the n plus, so maybe I can put all of this in a big square bracket for the time being, minus 1 to the n a1 divided by 2n plus 1 factorial, uh, sorry, this should be x to the 2n, pardon me, and this should be x to the 2n plus 1. So all I did was separate it out the even and odd powers, right? So be careful with the naming of these. I'm using n to represent which is even and which is odd here. So that means that I've separated out all of the even ans. That means it's all of the even powers. All of the odd ans, that's all of the odd powers. And we can multiply this out. Factor out the a0. I get n equal to 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n, uh, x to the 2n, divided by 2n factorial, plus a1, sum of n equal to 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1, divided by 2n plus 1 factorial. Now, you might have to really dig into the recesses of your mind here, but maybe you can take my word for this. Maybe you can pause the video and look it up. These are power series expansions for cosine and sine. So look what I got. A0 cos of x plus A1 sine of x. Look at what's interesting here too. A0 and A1, they're free. They can be whatever they want, right? My whole recurrence relation hinged on the fact that everything is in terms of a0 and a1. Now, why is that interesting? Well, look at the form of the solution. It looks a lot like what we did if we were to solve this thing as a homogeneous equation with constant coefficients. This essentially is my c1 term, that's my c2 term, right? It's a linear combination of solutions to the homogeneous equation. We know both sine and cosine solve this thing, and therefore, we know that their superposition also solves it. The superposition is given by the choice of A0 and A1, which can be identified using an initial condition. That's my C1 and my C2 terms that I see coming up over and over and over with all of this stuff. Okay, in the next video, we're going to go through a longer example known as Aries equation, but at least this illustrates the basics, and in particular, we're focusing on these ordinary points. So I'll see you in the next video.